Once again, it's Derby Day, and all day crowds have been making their way to Epsom Downs to see the major classic of the British racing season. Our commentator on the race is Peter Bromley, with Roger Mortimer to give a summary, and Michael Seth Smith is down in the paddock, where the horses will shortly be mounted before coming out on parade. We shall be hearing from him in a few minutes, but first for a description of the scene and the list of runners and riders, over to Peter Bromley in the grandstand. And good afternoon to you from Epsom on Derby Day 1961. And here, let me tell you, the sun is shining. It's an extremely pleasant, perfect day for racing. There's a, a cooling breeze to prevent it from getting too hot. And there is an enormous crowd here. Above me to the right, in the breeze, fluttering is the royal standard, denoting that Her Majesty the Queen uh, is gracing the meeting with her presence. Also in the royal party, her Royal Highness the Queen Mother, the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, and the Princess Royal. And the Queen is wearing a light green wool coat with a green and white check silk dress and a white hat. And the crowds really have been arriving since quite early on this morning. The car parks everywhere are packed, and as I look out over the enclosures in the center, the heath where people enjoy racing here perfectly free, you can, hardly, you can hardly find a space to put anybody. Away up to the left in the silver ring, the grandstands absolutely packed tight with people, charabangs, buses, and of course over in the center of the course, the swings, the roundabouts, the tents, the gypsies, the fortune tellers, all the fun of the fair, and all for free. Some of you may like to know the results of the two races that we've had here already. First of all, let me tell you, the two o'clock was won by Pelting, written by Stan Clayton, and that was his first win this season. He's been away nursing a serious injury and a very welcome return to the winner's enclosure for Stan Clayton, who rode Pelting at 100 to 6 from King's Probity, 13 to 2, and Ragtag's third, 5 to 1 joint favourite. The distance is there, three lengths and ahead, and the 2.30, the Catrum stakes over five furlongs, won by the favourite, Polly's Bow, 9 to 4 on from Abbott's Crescendo, 100 to 6, and Pastel, 3 to 1, only five ran. And now we come to the feature race of the day, the race we've all been waiting for, the 182nd renewal of the Derby Stakes. Let me tell you, there are no sensations, there are no surprises, unlike last year, and all the 28 probables that appeared in the favor are running, and there is no change in jockeys. Here they are then with the runners, the riders, and the draw, bearing in mind that the those considered uh, best drawn are those with the middle numbers, the high numbers having a slight disadvantage and the low numbers a slight disadvantage owing to the shape of the course. Here they are then, number one, Mr. Herbert Allen's Fleurmel, written by the French jockey Jean Massard and drawn 26. Before I go on, I ought to tell you that all carry nine stone, the same weight. Number two, Mr. J.J. Astor's Scatter, Joe Mercer, drawn 19. Number three, Mr. J. Ordain's Supreme Verdict by the Irish jockey P. Powell and drawn 15. Number four, Mr. E. W. Beach's Oakville, written by E. Hyde and drawn 14. Number five, Sir Francis Castle's Montana de Trevi, written by Brian Swift and drawn nine. Number six, Lord Derby's Latin lover, Douglas Smith, drawn 16. Number seven, Mr. C.H. Draculis, Pollock Tor, written by Duncan Keith and drawn 10. Number eight, Mrs. R.V.J. Evans, Nicomedes, Scobie Breezley, drawn 20. Number nine, Mr. T.R. Gordon's Patrick's Choice, J. Utley, drawn five. Number 10, Mrs. C.O. Iselin's Pardeo, Harry Carr, drawn three. Number 11, Miss Hermione Jacobson's Just Great, written by the Australian jockey Neville Selwood, and drawn 22. Number 12, Mr. H.J. Joel's Gallant Knight, Eve Smith, drawn 13. Number 13, Mr. G.C. Judd's Owen Davis, Stan Smith, S. Smith, the jockey, drawn 28. Number 14, Mr. Arthur Kennedy's Hot Brandy, Tommy Gosling, drawn 8. Number two, uh, number 15 rather, Mr. C. Marlon Klein's Neanderthal, drawn two, and written by the Australian jockey, Garnet Bougor. Number 16, 
Number 16, Mrs. H. Leggett's Bounteous, written by Joe Syme, drawn 11. Number 18, Mr. Joseph McGrath's Time Grain, written by the Australian jockey W. Williamson, and drawn 6. Number 20, Colonel E.J.H. Mary's Perfect Night, written by G. Lewis, and drawn 1. Number 21, Mr. Jerry Oldham's Sovrango, written by the Australian jockey George Moore, and drawn 12. Number 22, Mr. J.P. Phillips' Pinzon, E. Larkin, drawn 7. Number 23, Mrs. Arpad Flesh, with her colt Sidium, written by the French jockey Roger Poincelet, and drawn 4. Number 24, Baron Alex de Rothschild, with Alyosha, and ridden by the French jockey El Flavian, and drawn 18. Number 25, Madame R.B. Strasburger's Moutier, ridden by the French jockey Gerard Thieberf, and drawn 17. Number 26, Lady Honor Stedger's Cipriani, ridden by the Australian jockey Ron Hutchinson, and drawn 25. Number 27, the Countess de la Valdaine's Bellicure, written by F. Palmer, and drawn 21. Number 28, Madame Leon Volterra's Dicta Drake, written by M. Garcia, and drawn 27. Number 29, Sir Harold Werner's Duel, written by Jimmy Lindley, drawn 24. And finally, number 30, Mr. J.W. Weston Evans' Prince Tudor, written by Billy Rickaby, and drawn 23. And so the way they'll line up then on the inside rails, and remember that from numbers 1 to 6 they're considered badly drawn, and from 23 to 28 considered badly drawn. From the left, therefore, as they face up the course, as all numbering is done in flat racing, on the inside, drawn 1 is Perfect Knight, drawn 2, Neanderthal, 3, Pardeo, 4, Sidium, 5, Patrick's Choice, 6, Time Grey. Now they're considered the worst drawn because the, the centre of the field tend to come across these runners as they jump off and go up the hill in the first two furlongs. Then, number seven, drawn seven, pins on, eight, hot brandy, drawn nine, Fontana de Trevi, then ten, Polictor, eleven, Bounteous, twelve, Sovrango, thirteen, Gallant Knight, fourteen, Oakville, fifteen, Supreme Verdict, sixteen, Latin Lover, seventeen, Moutier, Next door to him is his co-Frenchman Alyosha, drawn 18, then comes Scatter, 19, Nicomedes, 20, Bellicure, 21, and Just Great, 22. And those also considered badly drawn on the far side, drawn 23, Prince Tudor, 24, Duel, 25, Cipriani, 26, Pleurmel, 27, Dicta Drake, and right on the outside, drawn 28, is Owen Davis. Well, there is the field, no surprises, no no changes in outrageous fortune that we experienced at this time last year, but let's see if there's been any significant change in the betting down there in the ring, and let's hear from Roger Mortimer. Betting is extremely open in this race. Moutier has retained his position as favourite, but he is at 7-1. to one. Pardeo is a second favourite at 8-1, to one, and I think it may surprise a good many people that he's at a slightly shorter price than Joss Great, who figures at nine to one. Uh, Dicta Drake, 100 to nine. Time Green, 100 to seven. 100 to seven, Duel and Savrango. 20 to one, Neanderthal. 25 to one, Bellicur, Latin Lover, Nicomedes, and Eliosha. As you were, Eliosha is 28 to 1, and it's 40 to 1 bar. Thank you, Roger Mortimer. Well, Moutier, the chestnut half-brother to Monteval, who was second to Lavender in 1956, and the half-brother to Pampon, who was second here in the Oaks last year, and running in the same colours as the ill-fated Angers, who unfortunately fell and broke a leg in this race last year, is the favourite. He's won his only two races this season, the Prix Daru, over a mile and a quarter, and the Prix Ocar. And on fringe form, he works out about four or five pounds behind Wright Royal, who can certainly be considered the best three-year-old colt in Europe. Some people were not so impressed with his 
win in the Priyoka when he took all his time to beat Alyosha. But I think uh, he certainly is a fine, good-looking colt. The only, of course, drawback is that his young rider, Gerard Thiebeuf, has a tremendous reputation to live up to, and he doesn't have very much experience of Epsom. Then there's Pardeo, owned by an American, Mrs. C.O. Iselin. He's certainly bred to do the part on his dam side because he's a product of the famous Sledmere stud, and the Sledmere stud sold his dam three weeks to go to America at the new market sales, and Pardeo traces right back to Pretty Polly. But he was unfortunately left in his first race, the free handicap, but then he trotted up in the mile and a half Lingfield Derby trial stakes when he beat Nicomedes by two lengths, and he certainly likes hard ground. Just Great, owned by certainly the youngest owner in the uh, owning horses in this race, and possibly if she wins, she'll be the youngest owner ever to win the race. Miss Hermani Jacobson, she's only 24, and Just Great, like uh, Savrango, is unbeaten this season. Won two races, he won the mile and a quarter Royal Stakes at Sandown, and then he won the Brighton Derby trial by a head from Jewel. And the Brighton course very greatly resembles Epsom in the left hand, and there's a downhill stretch, and he is reported to have gone extremely well with Apostle at home in, in very favorable weight concession. In other words, Just Great was giving Apostle weight and apparently they finished almost upside and I needn't remind you, Apostle won here yesterday. Then there's Dicta Drake, who's come very late into the Derby market. He's owned by Madame Susie Volterra and he's a son of her Phil Drake, who won this Derby, the Derby in 1955 in the same colors. Well, he was unraised as a two-year-old Dicta Drake, but he's won his last two races. And in winning the Prix du Printemps at Saint Cloud nine days ago, French judges seem to think that he worked out just about the equal of Moutier. Anyway, here he is with the famous Volterra colours once again with a fancied runner in our Derby. Time Grain at 100 to seven at the moment. Irish bred and own. This year, his form is excellent. He beat Light Year over seven furlongs at the Curra and Lightyear then went on to win the Irish 2000 Guineas. He then ran third in our 2000 Guineas to Rockhaven, beaten two lengths and a short head. And he used to be rather too free in his running and a little excitable and rather temperamental, but I believe, I'm told by his trainer Seamus O'Brien, Seamus McGrath, that in fact he's settled down extremely well this season. Then there's Duel, who won the seven furlong 2000 Guineas trials stakes at Kempton in April. He was unplaced in the Guineas behind Rockhaven and ran an unaccountably bad race there. And then he was beaten ahead by Just Great in the mile and a half Brighton Derby trial stakes back in a little earlier in this month when he was reported to be unlucky in running when he had to gallop around a fallen horse. He's certainly a very handy horse. He's tremendously game and he's bred to win a Derby. And he'll have the advantages of one of the best horsemen in England, Jimmy Lindley. Then Savrango, a half-brother to Musidora, who won the Oaks. He's unbeaten this season. He won over a mile and a quarter at Newbury. And then he won the Chester Vars very, very impressively by five lengths. He's the biggest horse in the race. He stands 16 hands, over 16 hands. He's owned by Mr. Jerry Olden, whose colors were carried here on by Fidalgo, who ran second to Parthia, and also by Talgo, who won the Irish Derby, and who, like Savrango, is by Krakateo. Unfortunately for Harry Rag, his trainer, and for Mr. Oldham, they engaged Douglas Smith to ride, but he was later required for Latin lover, and so they were caught without a rider, and so immediately he got on the phone to Australia, rang up George Moore, who was riding in Sydney on Saturday, and arrived here on the Sunday, and here he is riding in our derby, and he returns and will be riding back in Sydney, Australia, on Saturday. It just hardly seems possible, but this is 1961, I suppose, and we must, with jet transport, we must expect things like that. Anyway, there seems to be a world shortage of jockeys at the moment, and no doubt these Australians, there are six of them riding in this race, are going to exploit this. Well, there's Neanderthal, also ridden by an Australian jockey, Garni Bougor, who's the stable jockey for Vincent O'Brien. He's a very much improved horse. He's a half-brother to Al Kears, who was second to Paddy uh, in the derby, second to St. Paddy in the Derby last year, and he's by Nierula, who's now unfortunately dead. He was fifth in the Irish 2,000 guineas to light year, but according to his trainer, he's improved since then, and he did a fine gallop recently in Ireland, and uh, on, his, on the result of that gallop, 
his trainer Vincent O'Brien uh, has allowed him to come over here and take his chance and certainly he's he certainly has improved tremendously in looks since that Curra race a chance possibly now to find out from Roger Mortimer if there's been any significant change in the betting Moutier has hardened by two points and is now clear favorite at five to one eight to one Pardeo nine to one just great and then there are four horses figuring at a hundred to eight dictated the rake time green duel and Savranga. 20 to 1 Neanderthal, Latin lover, 22 to 1 Bellica, and 25 to 1 Nicomedes, 33 to 1 Bar. And as you spoke Roger, the parade has started, they're filing past in Indian file across the course, up past the winning post, and uh, these 28 three-year-old Colts parading for the 182nd renewal of the Derby Stakes. And brilliant scene this, the best three-year-olds in England and France and Ireland, with the possible exception of Wright Royal. An enormous crowd up in the grandstand, packing, thronging the grandstand, and over on the far side of the course, packed absolutely tight. Hundreds of thousands of people come here to see this great race. And away up the center, this green ribbon of turf, and in a few minutes time, some ten minutes time it'll all be over and there'll be hard luck stories no doubt but one horse one horse will stand in this winner's enclosure down below and will be hailed as the best three-year-old here in Britain and heading the parade Plower Mel recently bought by American industrialist Mr. Herbert Allen who is better known as the owner of High Perch and he's wearing his famous white with red cross belts all perfectly calm and collected. The only one that's out of line is just great, playing up a little bit, but they're all walking quite quietly up the far rails, a little bit on their toes, one or two of them, but there are no signs any of them are going to give any trouble. Moutier walking below me now, perfectly calm. There were doubts that his, he might get excited in this parade. He's looking extremely cool, beautifully turned out, a flashy chestnut with a lot of white, four white socks and a white face and his Jockey Thieberp looking relaxed and confident and of course he has that awful experience last year with Angers to remember but he certainly isn't showing any signs of nervousness. In fact I think this young jockey has matured considerably since he came over last year. Well we've got down to Bellicure who was a winner at St. Cloud in March. Then he was third to match at Longchamp but he's quite a long way behind the best horses of his age in France and he has quite a lot to catch up with on Moutier. Alyosha is one of the fancied French horses. He's had two races, both in France, although beaten in both, he certainly isn't disgraced. And he was beaten a length by Moutier in the pre card and ran extremely well. He's full of stamina, his pedigree, and he certainly pegged away. And here they come, cantering back to the start, headed by Pleurmel, going with a nice easy action with the French jockey Jean Massard. Scatter is next, a black colt by Sicombre. Also the Sarah Moutier, then comes Oakville going past Fontana de Trevi and a nice chestnut, a light chestnut supreme verdict. Latin lover, fine looking horse with a grand stride going past with Douglas Smith. Pollock Tor really stretching his toe, going past now. Then Nicomedes with Scobie holding on tight. Nicomedes taking a strong hold. Then the outside of Patrick's Choice. Pardeo, the chestnut, going past now with Harry Carr. And here comes Just Great fairly pinging along. And uh, Selwood allowing him not very much rain and he's gone past now with Gallant Knight also trying to give Eve Smith a difficult time on the way to the start but Eve Smith holding on next here comes another outsider Owen Davis and Stan Smith Owen Davis a half brother to Mr. Jerry Judd's hurdle winner fair time then come a cantering down now hot brandy in the same colors that Oroy carried so well in this race last year Neanderthal another chestnut with a white blaze very good looking coat this he's going down steadily with the Australian Garni Borgor then Bounteous wearing blinkers coming past and Time Graham fairly swinging along Time Graham whom Bill Williamson is having the greatest difficulty restraining going down very fast then comes Perfect Night going evenly with Savrango behind maybe just feeding the going a little bit Savrango going down a little bit but he's moving better now as he warms up pins on next behind pins on Sidium and going off extremely fast, Alyosha, 
a very bright bay with a nose band. And here comes the favorite now, Moutier, with a fine action, but he's apt to carry his head a little high, making it rather difficult to restrain him at his slow paces, but Thebus giving him plenty of rain. And then Cipriani, the blinkered Cipriani, and Ron Hutchinson, the Australian, going down in front of us at a nice level pace. Then here's Bellicure, the blinkered Bellicure, another French runner, striding out. And then Dicta Drake, a bay with a, a light blaze, a white blaze. Then Duel, going down very beautifully balanced. Duel with Jimmy Lindley. And last of all, last of all now, is Prince Tudor and Billy Rickaby. Prince Tudor probably running the uh, running that in love for, and uh, Sobranco for I think they're probably the three biggest horses in the race. Well now they're going away out of my sight down into the paddock and although we can see them down in the paddock watching them at close quarters on the rails is Michael C. Smith. So come in Michael C. Smith and tell us uh, how do they look down there in the paddock. Well, as I'm speaking to you now, the horses are just beginning to walk slowly past me, not in the order they came down. In fact, um, Scatter and Gallant Knight are the first two down. I saw in the course of the last three quarters of an hour all the runners parading in the paddock, and let me say straight away that the three outstanding ones were Time Grain, Dick to Drake, and Duel, with Moutier probably about the fourth best looking horse. Moutier himself, he's got tremendous quarters. He was playing up a little bit, and he, to me he seems a little light framed, but he's got the most wonderful action. And as I'm standing here now, I can see him going down very, very quietly. He's, without any question of doubt, a worthy favorite. And his jockey, of course, as Peter Bromley has said, has the awful worry of what's going to happen this year after Angers' disaster before. But although some people say that chestnuts have a bad record in classic races, Moutier does today look wonderful. Just great. Personally, I was a little disappointed with him. He didn't look really quite as well to me as he did when he won the Brighton Derby trial recently, and Duel seems to have come on much more since that race. On the other hand, Just Great, who cost 3,600 when he was bought from the Merton Agnes stud, he's a very nice mover, he's got great scope, and I'm told that he acts on any going. Time Grain, well, that was the one who, which quite honestly took my fancy more than any other in the paddock. He is the number one Irish hope, and although he doesn't really like hard going, he's a tough, resolute horse. He was very placid, turned out looking absolutely superb, and he really does seem to me to be the pick of this derby field. Duel, as I've said before, looks magnificent. Going quickly through the runners as they appear on the race card, the French horses Plurmel is a little disappointing. I don't think he'll act at all on this going. And Dicta Drake looked very much better than he did. The two of them, before racing started, were being walked by their stable lads quite quietly up and down under the trees. And they were, in fact, the first two horses which we saw. Scatter, he looked wonderful when he won at Hearst Park earlier in the year. But I don't think he looks today quite up to the class of winning this race. Supreme Verdict, he's a very nice Supreme Court Colt, a little bit flashy. He's playing up slightly in the paddock, although he's giving no trouble as he goes down to the post now. And I know that he is very much fancied in Ireland. Oakville coming down from the north, looked a bit outclassed. So also did Fontana de Trevi. Latin Lover, a little bit disappointing. Pelicator, he was also giving some trouble in the paddock, but he's gone down to the start very quietly and Duncan Keith, I think, thinks he'll give him a very good ride. Nicomedes, who takes after his sire Nimbus and almost looks the spitting living image of his ill-fated brother Nucleus, looked really superb, although one felt that perhaps with more time in the autumn, he would be a better horse than he is now. Patrick's choice didn't uh, sort of look particularly well in this company. Pardeo, well, he is a dolly nice colt. He cost 7,000 when he was bought, and he looked trained to the minute, but he certainly doesn't catch the eye. Gallant Knight, sweating a little in the paddock. Owen Davis, one didn't really notice him in this company, and neither did one notice Hot Brandy. Neanderthal, also greatly fancied in Ireland, gives the impression that he'll be very much better in the autumn. 
bounteous, wearing blinkers, was one of the few horses giving some trouble going down to the start. Perfect Knight, who you remember won over this course at the Epsom Spring Meeting, looked, turned out fit to run for his life, but he again looks a little backward. Savrango, the experts all seem to think he'll have difficulty in coming down Tatnam Corner. He's terribly straight in front. Pins on. Well, if you want a rank outsider, he's certainly of the unfancied horses in the races. He's by far the best looking. Azidium, the horse which was giving more trouble than any other. Aliosha, he's a very strong quartered horse, but rather common looking. Cipriani, also wearing blinkers, not particularly distinguished. And I didn't like Bellicue. Dicta Drake, he really is a wonderful looking individual. And he and Time Grain, together with Jewel, seem to be the outstanding three in this race. Well now, as I am talking to you, the horses are going up towards the starting gate. Most of them have already come through the channel leading up to the gate, and so I'll hand you back for a commentary on the race to Peter Bromley in the grandstand. And from the grandstand, we look away across the course, across this horseshoe course, down to the mile and a half start, where most of the runners who've now made their way up the narrow way from the rubbing house across the, the downs here, up to the mile and a half start. Horseshoe shaped course with an uphill gradient up for the first three furlongs. Then at the top of the hill with a mile to go, they start swinging left-handed. Then they reach Tattenham Hill with six furlongs to go, they start the descent. And then this is the crucial part of the race. Round left-handed, downhill, thundering round this corner, down Tattenham Corner, into the straight, four furlongs to go they then have. And it, it then is a very short run in because the Horses nearly always that win have to be well placed, are well placed on this vital, crucial Tattenham corner. Then, of course, the last desperate sprint to the line where I'm afraid I'm not exactly on the line. And if the judge calls on the evidence of the camera, then we'll have to wait for the photograph to be developed. The going, let me say, very, very firm. And it might be a good chance as they're down there having their girths attended to, to call in Roger Mortimer once again to hear if there's been any change in the betting. Very little change of importance in the betting. Moutier is still favorite at five to one. Seven to one Pardeo, nine to one just great. Four horses at 100 to eight, namely Sovrango, Dicta Drake, Time Green and Duel. 20 to one Neanderthal and Latin Lover, 25 to one Bar. Thank you, Roger. Five French horses then, Fleurmel, Aliosha, Moutier, Bellicure, and Dicta Drake. Four Irish horses, Supreme Verdict, Neanderthal, Time Grain, and Cipriani. Six Australian jockeys, one Irish, and six French jockeys. And of course, three American owners. That's the international setup for the English Derby here at Epsom, 1961. The three American owners, Mr. Herbert Allen, with Pleurmel, who recently bought Pleurmel from France, Mrs. Iselin with Pardeo, and Mr. C. Marlon Klein from Philadelphia, the owner of Neanderthal, trained away in Tipperary by Vincent O'Brien. I suppose we ought to call Madame Strasburger, American and American in Paris, and I'm sure everyone hopes that she'll have better luck than she's experienced in these previous Epsom derbies, when her luck must surely be the cruelest ever with Moot Monteval beaten a neck by Lavendin, Pampon beaten a head in the Oaks here, and of course the terrible tragedy that occurred to Ange Angers in the race last year. Now all, this, all the 28 runners, you've just joined us, let me remind you that 28 are at the post, and any minute now they'll be coming under starter's orders. The flag is up, the white flag up, only perfect night is at the back of the field. They're coming up rather quickly into line, it could be a go first time. Here they come and they're off first time to a very good start to an extremely good start, and they're running now with the leaders going away on the inside. Time Grain is one of the early leaders from Pollock, Tor and Pardio on the outside. Moutier and Oakville is well up there. Hot Brand is one of the leaders. Fontana de Trevi dropping back a little, is, and Sidium is last of all. Now they've covered a furlong, and it's Time Grain from Supreme Verdict. Moutier is there. Towards the outside is Duel. On the inside, Pinzon and Pardeo. Then comes on the outside Cipriani and Gallant Knight, then Perfect Knight and Neanderthal, then Fontana de Trevi, then Bounteous, then Oakville and Savrango, then Pleurmel and Aliosha, then Polyctor and Nicomedes, and the last group, Owen Davis, Latin Lover, Dicta Drake and Sidium and Scatter. That's the last group. 
they have a mile to run still and the leader on the outside Patrick's Choice on the inside, the leader pins on in second place, then comes Bounteous and Supreme Verdict, then Time Grain on the rails. Towards the outside comes Duel and Perfect Knight, and then comes Pleurmel, and on the extreme wide outside, Prince Tudor up there with the leaders. Seven furlongs from home now. Patrick's Choice setting them a good gallop, pins on second, Bounteous third, Moutier now four. Behind Moutier is Time Grain, then Duel. Behind Duel comes Prince Tudor, then Pardio, then Savrango going up on the inside, then Cipriani, and behind Cipriani, Nicomedes, behind Nicomedes, just great, and then Perfect Knight, Latin Lover making headway on the outside, six furlongs to run, starting the descent down Tattenham Hill, left-handed now with Patrick's Choice and Duel, the leader, and Supreme Verdict up there with them, these three in the lead, then comes Pinzon, Cipriani, then in behind Pinzon is is Prince Tudor and Bounteous on the rails, then comes Bellicur, Savrango, Moutier, very well placed on the rails in about seventh place, making the turn into the straight, down Tattenham Corner now, and the leader is Supreme Verdict for Ireland from Duel, nearest to the stand side, then Patrick's Choice dropping back, then comes Bounteous, behind Bounteous, Cipriani, and then comes Savrango making a move, behind Savrango, Bellicur, Moutier, who's having a little trouble getting out, he can't get out, and it's now Duel, it comes to the front with two furlongs to run and into the straight ditch duel from Bounteous on the far side Cipriani is there so is so is Sobrango and Latin Lover coming on the stand side and then comes Bellicur duel is beaten Pardeo is well placed and Dicta Drake is there but it's Cipriani now Cipriani from Sobrango and Latin Lover and Pardeo and Dicta Drake and Sidio a furlong to run and it's Cipriani and Sobrango and here comes Dicta Drake and Pardeo and Sidio coming on the wide outside to beat them all 50 yards to go Sidio is going to win on the line Sidio has won the derby City of the winner in second place is Dick to Drake. Then comes Pardeo, then Sobrango, then Cipriani. And that was a sensational race. A sensational race. There's no doubt about the winner, which is Sidium. And the judge has called for a photograph for second place, but I think Dick to Drake was second. And I think Pardeo was third, but that's my own personal opinion. There's no doubt about the winner, which is Mrs. Arpad Flesh's Sidium, trained by Harry Rag at Newmarket and ridden by the French jockey Roger Poincelet. A sensational finish to a race that appeared open even to the last 50 yards when Pardeo, Dick to Drake, the winner Sidium and Savrango all looked to have winning chances. But it was Sidium that won, no doubt about the winner. It's Sidium the winner. Sidium named after a flower as all this owner's racehorses are and brought with a beautifully timed run on the outside of the field to collar everyone and go past the post, a convincing winner of the derby. And second, second place, we are still waiting for the judge to announce the photograph. Dicta Drake, if you hear the numbers called, is number 28, and Pardeo, number 10. And my opinion was that Dicta Drake beat Pardeo, but we are still waiting for the judge. Mrs. Arpad Plesh, delighted no doubt with her Pardal coat Sidium, fancied far less than the stable's other runner Sovrango for whom George Moore was brought all the way from Australia to ride and second was Dick to Drake and third was Pardale. Sidium the winner, Dick to Drake was second and Pardale third and we're just waiting two lengths between first and second, and a neck between second and third. With Harry Rag's other runner, Sovrango, in fourth place. So Harry Rag has the distinction of training the first and the fourth, but certainly not in the order that, that we, or I think anybody else, anticipated. Well, watching this race up here with me is Roger Mortimer. Roger, if you're not too astonished at that result, will you come in and give us a summary? Well. The fact is that nine horses out of ten loathe hard ground, but the stock of some sars are notorious for their ability to act on the hard, and one of those sars is Pardell. And it was shown today how his stock really loved to hear their feet rattle as he sired not only the winner Presidium, but also the third horse Pardell. Of course, it was a tremendous turn-up, Presidium finishing in front of his stable companion, Savranga. But I know that in recent weeks, Harry Rag has been hoping for rain 
for Savrango, but at the same time, he's always held the opinion that if the going was really hard, Presidium might run a very good race. Though I don't think he visualized him winning, and certainly on form, it was impossible to visualize him beating Moutier. But there we were. It was an absolutely clear-cut victory, and Presidium swooped down on the leaders inside the final furlong, and produced a tremendous burst of speed to draw clear and win by two lengths. Dicta Drake ran a magnificent race and looked like pulling it off once again for Madame Volterra, but he just couldn't find that little bit of extra speed in the final 200 yards. Pardeo ran a magnificent race. He came with one long run in the last two furlongs, although I'm not sure just at the start of that run he had an entirely clear passage. He gave everything he had, he ran a fine race, and thoroughly deserved to be placed. Savrango ran a, a good race, just couldn't quicken in the final stages. And I think for a horse, big horse, who's distinctly straight in front, he earns absolutely full marks for his courageous display on going that couldn't have suited him. He might well, I think, have won this race had the going been soft. Moutier, I thought, had every chance at the turn for home, but didn't run on. And Just Great was another who was disappointing. Duel showed up early in the straight, but didn't quite last it out and was beginning to give ground below the distance. But they're a clear-cut victory for the stable second string who acted on the hard going and found that little decisive vital bit of extra speed in the final 150 yards. Thank you, Roger Mortimer. And it's significant, of course, that the starting price of the winner was exactly the same as the price of the winner of the 2,000 guineas, namely 66 to 1. I thought we were probably in for that sort of year. And here they are, the full prices, Sidium 66 to 1, Dicta Drake 100 to 8, Pardeo 13 to 2, and the fourth horse, Savrango, started at 100 to 7. The distance is two lengths and a neck, and Moutier was favourite at 5 to 1. And just before we leave Epsom, let me recap the results of the previous races, the 2 o'clock, won by Pelting at 100 to 6 from King's Probity 13 to 2 and Ragtag's 5 to 1 joint favourite. The 2.30 won by Polly's Bow, the favourite at 9 to 4 on from Abbott's Crescendo 100 to 6 and Pastel 3 to 1, only 5 ran and once again the result of the 1961 oh. derby. First, Sidium 66 to 1, second, Dicta Drake 100 to 8, third, Pardeo 13 to 2 and with that probably surprising news Surprising to most of us, I'm sure. It's time for me to say goodbye to you from Epsom and return you to the studio. Our commentator on the derby was Peter Bromley and the summary was by Roger Mortimer. Before the race, Michael Seth Smith gave the latest news from the paddock. Now from Epsom tomorrow at three o'clock, there'll be commentary on the Coronation Cup.